Barry saw a tree come down. He decided to stay home. So Brian is in for Barry for the last two hours, and I thank Chris McCarthy for doing hour one of the Barry Richard show so I could take a little bit of a breather and catch my breath after being on with JR earlier today. Wow. The amount of snow that's come down since early this morning when I came in, there was no snow, but there's plenty right now right here in our, our beautiful driveway and parking lot. Just to let you know, if you're going to be on the go somewhere and you have an internet connection, this hour of the Barry Richard Show will be up on our YouTube page at WBSM 1420. I'm going to, well, I'm going to tell you right now, I guess. At the latter end of the second hour, so the two o'clock hour, we're going to be joined by Phil Paleologus. Phil is going to give us a, a brief weather report of how things are going in Fort Myers at this particular time. And that's the lead in for New Bedford Day. As you know, Phil is in Florida. He is going to be at the Shell Factory broadcasting live from 3 to 5 this afternoon. So he'll join us a little bit before 3 o'clock to give us an idea of how many people are there, et cetera, et cetera. During this second hour of the Barry Richard Show, we're going to be joined by Chris Cotter. He's going to join us by phone. He is a member of the New Bedford School Committee and joining me in studio is John Oliveira of that same New Bedford School Committee. As Taylor has told you uh, in the news, and you can also see at WBSM.com, Eversource is reporting roughly 15,000 customers in the South Coast area without electricity. Now, that was at 1130 this morning. The number could have gone up. It, it may have come down. My guess is, judging by the way the snow is blowing and the heaviness of the snow, uh, there may be more customers without power. A Cushnet, as of 1130, had 580 customers without electricity. Dartmouth, about 1,450. Fairhaven, 320. Freetown, 582. Lakeville, 341. Marion, more than 1,800 customers without electricity. Mattapoisett, 3,105. New Bedford, 788. Rochester, 1,311. Westport, 282. Wareham, 5,086. And if you're on the Cape, over 60,000 without now the, that's interesting the cape is supposed to have less than a foot of snow but the wind you know how the cape is you know wind from the left of us wind from the right of us they always get socked so over 60,000 customers on cape cod without electricity at this particular time last evening i was at the keith middle school for the new bedford school committee meeting and if you need no dose you, you, <laughs> to, to stay awake, I would suggest taking a couple of packs to a school committee meeting. Last night's meeting was a little slow, if you know what I mean. But there were a couple of issues of interest to me, and I'm, and I'm sure to a few other people. It deals with school safety. One of the particular issues deals with, you know, how do you protect the schools? and the students and the staff in the wake of Parkland, Florida. The, another one that came up, which may have taken a back seat, deals with some of the issues over at the middle school. Let's go to issue number one, because of the fact that it was during this time that I heard from one of the school committee members, John Oliveira, who asked... I believe of either Mr. O'Leary of the school department or Jason DeFalco exiting uh, deputy commissioner of uh, schools, superintendent of schools, a question of how many students are actually going through a training for some type of active shooter event. 
And the response was none. And John then stated that he believes that the students should be going through such a, a training similar to going through a fire drill. Now, to some of the people that I was sitting with, that made absolutely perfect sense. However, to members of the New Bedford School Committee, it didn't resonate the same way. And to be honest with you, I was a little surprised. One comment from committee member Amaral, Josh Amaral, was that he feared training students might traumatize them. Traumatize them. Now, if I can quickly go into the background of John Oliveira, ex-military. Now, you know military people go through training and training and training so they can be asleep and know what the heck they're doing. Christopher Cotter, ex-military, current police, he knows the need and necessity of training. They still go through it as, as police officers, former school resource officer. So I was very, very surprised last evening when I didn't see any action by the school committee to move forward with making sure that students have an idea of what the heck to do when some maniac comes busting into the school wielding a knife or a gun or a, an AR-15, which is a, a high-powered rifle. Joining me in studio is John Oliveira. John, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good How are after you doing? Good afternoon, Brian. And I'm glad you brought your son with you today. Absolutely. So... Your thoughts about how that all went down last evening? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think it was certainly something that needed to be addressed uh, since the Parkland shooting. Uh, we've, I've had numerous constituents, uh, parents, staff people contact me regarding uh, school safety issues. Uh, so it, it certainly needed to be, be brought up. Um, there is still some, we're still working on some procedures in regards to the full Alice train. Uh, Alice the, stands for? Oh, boy, you, you're going to put me on the spot well, here. Well, somebody has to. Um, I, I don't remember what the uh, I, I have it for. written down here it's, um, uh, somewhere, and I'll find it. Uh, keep going. It's, but anyway, so the, the Alice train, now there are different levels of Alice training. You can go to the Alice website. There's uh, an Alice website. Yes, there is, and, and, it's, and it's very informative. You can download several documents. It talks about training children. Um, in the in the full blown Alice training, they will use like soft air rifles um, that shoot the the soft BBs. Uh, you don't need to do that in an element in, in, in the school uh, when you're training the children, but you do need to make children aware because the last thing you need is for them to announce that you that you have a shooter or you have an incident on campus, and the only people that seem to know what to do are are the stu are the faculty. Uh, it makes things a lot easier if the children are prepared and they know. And I'm not saying this has to be a monthly drill, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year, similar to the fire drills. Uh, I don't think it's a traumatic experience. You know, my God, in, in the 1950s and 60s, we were putting, hiding underneath desks because we were waiting for the atomic bomb to drop on us. Um, I, I think that that's really far-fetched. And, and this is, to me, is a life skill. Well, you know, you say you think it's far-fetched in the 1950s and 60s. It didn't seem that way. And that's why folks learned. Here's something Well, I'm else. saying far-fetched about being traumatic. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Got you on that. We go through fire drills. I would believe, I don't know the last time that there was a school fire, and I hope that there aren't any. It's, but It has been decades. There, there, the chances of a school fire seem to be more prevalent than certainly an atomic explosion, you know, mm -hmm. premeditated, no matter what we might think of uh, North Korea and, and things that are going on there. And even school shootings, as devastating as they are, still less than 1% of 1% of schools have seen a school shooting. Uh, there have been too many, but yeah. no, the absolutely. numbers are, are absolutely low. But 
I'm hearing talk about let's arm the school staff, let's have more police in school, let's have metal detectors, et cetera, et cetera, for something that happens to less than 1% mm. Of 1% of schools. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And, you know, it kind of goes along with the TS, like, for instance, the TSA. And I'm a strong believer that 90% of what they do is appearance for the for the American public to give them the warm, comfy feeling. And, that, and that's all metal detectors are going to do. What you need to do is we need to teach our children, number one, what to do in an emergency. Number two... We need our children to learn to identify the signs in people that may be having mental health issues. If you, you realize most of these workplace shootings and school shootings are usually someone from that school or that workplace. It's usually not somebody coming in from, it's somebody known. From out to, of town, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and that's huge is when we're able to identify a need in an other individual that says a lot for us about as us about a people and a country and what we're teaching our kids. Not putting more weapons in the school, uh, not arming teachers. I, you know, I'm totally against that. We do need to secure our schools better. Uh, metal detectors have come up uh, not only um, in many other school plans outside of New Bedford, but I believe the New Bedford City Council talked about having metal detectors mm -hmm. in. New Bedford schools. Your thoughts on that? Uh, unless we want to see it like Boston's Logan Airport every morning uh, when you're bringing kids to school, you know, please arrive two hours early. Um, it, it be, you know, it becomes an issue. And I think we need to give children um, and, and our young men and women, you know, to all this, you know, to just give them a blanket. We don't trust you. And, and I think we need to establish that trust with them. And, and I think that's why it is so important that we have staff that stays with our district, that they have consistency in the schools, because that makes it all more, much more important that the teacher is able to engage with the student. And that's where this kind of education really comes into place. John Oliveira with us today. We will be joined by Chris Cotter in just a bit, also with the New Bedford School Committee. I... Um, Again, I think that there are many ideas that are out there, but this should be decided at the local level. I don't think we need a statewide plan, and certainly we don't need a mm -hmm. federal plan dealing with all of this. But that stated, we have uh, an attorney general candidate who wouldn't mind arming school staff. We have a gubernatorial candidate uh, who uh, thinks the same way. What's wrong with arming teachers and, and school staff? I, I think it sends, number one, it sends the wrong message. It, it doesn't send a message about education. Uh, it, it sends a message, uh, you know, kind of give you that paramilitary image, uh, you know, the police officer, the military person. Um, and, and I don't think it allows for the free flow of, of thought in, in the classroom if you're having somebody with a weapon. Um, and plus, now who are we going to decide who can carry a weapon? Some of the, I mean, teachers get assaulted right here in New Bedford. And we're going to, and, and so arming them is a good thing. What happens if that student is bigger than that teacher and is able to take that teacher down and take that weapon? How much training, uh, you know, we have shootings with police officers that may be good shootings or, or determined to be a bad shooting. What happens when we start arming people in schools? At what point are they going to draw that weapon? Uh, I, there's too many variables, and I, 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 I would not be sending my children to school if teachers were armed. They would be homeschooled. Really? Absolutely. Well, it, here's my thought. If the schools really are not safe, why would a parent send their child children to school? If, if you didn't think that school was safe, whether it's because of school shootings and more to the point, what really is happening in some of the middle schools that I found out last night that really shocked me. Um, why are parents sending them there? Well, th no, we're talking two different animals. You were yes, just, we are. You were just talking about... Uh, but but th I'm talking about safety. Now, if we're talking about disciplinary issues, we, we don't... Well, and that's when, one when, of the reasons. When, when, what's a gun going to accomplish in when, the classroom? When a child is assaulted, yep. that's a criminal issue. That's more it should than, be. That's more that... Yes, it should be. But th that's what I'm getting at. More of that happens in schools, not just New Bedford, yes. but yes. all around the country than 
a school shooting, yet everybody's up in arms because of, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a horrific event when there's a school shooting. Nobody knows about uh, the gang violence in certain schools or sexual assaults that might be happening, but are certainly more uh, prevalent than a a school shooting. Absolutely. And those and those are very much kept very quiet. Um, And unless you are being told about them, um, you, you know, if if you look at the at the media reporting at the at the schools, everything is fine, and but it's not, and parents know that, and it and it is difficult to say. I have three kids in the New Bedford school systems, and especially at the middle schools, sometimes it is difficult knowing what's going on there, and that you hear about, and I hear it not only from students, I hear it from teachers, I hear it from parents. Uh, and and that's a big concern that the school committee is not being told what's going on in in hard numbers. If I can now go back, uh, we're going to take a break in just a bit, and then we'll bring Chris Carter on. But if I can take you back to last night's meeting, when we talk about the the issue of of training students to know mm-hmm. what to do if is it possible as we look at the makeup of the school committee. Uh, at least last night, you're the only school committee member with children in the system. Could it be something that you see and you're hearing from other parents who have kids in the system, whereas the others do not? Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, that may very well uh, be a, be an issue. I think one of the things that, that we do agree on is not bringing weapons into the schools. Um but, uh, you know, I, I, it's just important that we, you know, we do this training. I mean, you saw the Boston bomb, marathon bombing. Uh, if people, had, you know, if, as a culture, if we had been doing this for 10, 20 years, uh, you know, we would have, people would have identified a package sitting there. You go to Israel and that doesn't happen. Yeah, you, you, you well, know? but I think a lot of people don't want to be like Israel. Well, we don't, but it, in today's society... You have to have that level of security about you. Uh, you know, to me, it's common sense. It, it's it's survival skills. All right. So you don't think if well, obviously your your background with the military uh, has taught you a bit, but you don't think that maybe it's because uh, you have kids in the system, and so it's a little bit closer to you um, to want that kind of training. No, yeah, I never really considered it that way. I mean. But, you know, I mean, I just looked at it this the way I feel. I mean, my wife feels the same way about that. All right. Then the other thing that came to mind last evening is could committee members and others be going after the messenger instead of the message that you're trying to send? Uh, let's face it. You rocked the apple <laughs> cart back in November. Um. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, I, I never you know, you never know. Well, uh, you know, I would hope not. I would hope that, that we are there for the, for the best interest of the, of the students. All right, John Oliveira in studio. We have Chris Cotter going to join us in just a bit. And, yes, we will take your phone calls at 508-996-0500. Brian in for Barry.
Brian in for Barry this afternoon because of the snow. Phil is going to be joining us a little bit before 3 o'clock for New Bedford Day festivities. If you'd like to check us out on the Internet, you can see us on the YouTube page. I have to thank Matt Costa for all of this because I would never get it up properly. So, uh, Matt, thank you. Uh, but you can go to our YouTube page at WBSM 1420. In studio is John Oliveira. And joining me on the phone is New Bedford School Committee member and New Bedford police officer and man without power today, Christopher Cotter. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. How'd your motorhome make it in? Uh, the didn't have to go anywhere. It, it just stayed where it was. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it was parking lot bound, and I said, I think I can walk across the street. Well, good for you. You know, it, sometimes it's easier. And, you know, if I need a little extra heat, I just turn on the motor and <laughs> there it is. Hey, how you doing? Otherwise. Not bad. How about yourself? Excellent, excellent. And and in studio with us is John Oliveira, your uh, colleague on the school committee. That is correct. How are you doing, John? Good. So I would like to get into the meat and potatoes. We spent a, a little bit talking about last night's meeting, in particular training students on what to do if there's an active shooter event. Nobody wants it to happen, but... I, I have to agree with John Oliveira. I believe there's a need for kids to be trained similar to how we train them in case there's a fire. Well, like I said last night, Brian, I, I, I'm i not one who is in favor of or going to advocate um, training students for that type of a scenario. Um, you know, again, I mean, I think, you know, when it comes to fire drills, and I made this comparison last night, when it comes to fire drills, um, you know, kids don't take it seriously because they know that it's a drill. One one person sees the fire truck outside the school, and then pretty soon everybody knows that the fire truck's there, and then when the alarm goes off, everybody just walks through and, you know, does the motion. I, I get you on that, but here's – and you just said it. They go through the motion. That's because they know what to do. They've been through it several times. Well, there's, there's a difference, I think, um, you know, in my mindset. And, and the studies, they're all over the place, so there really is no set um, tone as far as whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I think between federal agencies – I think even they can't get the the decision to be consistent. Um, you know, and it, again, I, I I'm not one who wants to advocate. And when it comes to a fire versus um, you know a, a using an active shooter or whatever the case is, I I believe that they're two completely separate. Um, one is going to be a lot more, well, would, would tend to be a lot more chaotic um, because, again, it's it, it's just a whole different different scenario. So, I mean, I, I really can't compare apples to apples on this one. I, I hear you on that. It, they, they aren't apple to apple, but when was the last time that there was a school fire? Well, let, let's. Let, let we, I can ask you the same thing as far as uh, we've had two incidents down at the Gome School where we've had the fire respond to a situational. One was a, a small vent fire, and the other was another small fire with the the boiler system. So, I mean, we do have some issues that we have, and that's worked. Okay, well, then let me ask you, I don't know that there's one particular remedy for uh, an active event. What would you suggest as a safety measure or safety measures to make sure that the school and, and, and staff and students are safe? Well, I think the district is, is taking a look at um – you know, ways that we can try to secure the building, um, maybe a little bit more. Um, you know, so, I mean, we're, we're 
going to do our due diligence to make sure that we're enhancing those safety features. Um, you know, there's no, and, and you know, I, I said it last night, and I'll say it again now. There is there is no way to prevent a tragedy that has happened in Florida, Columbine, um, you know, and the several other schools. There's no way to prevent that from happening with 100% guarantee. All we can do is make sure that the responsible adults that are in our schools have the tools necessary to make sure that they're doing what they can do to ensure the safety of our children. But we also cannot say that these teachers and staff members that are being trained are going to respond the way they're being taught. It, it's human nature. There's it, a human nature element that, that we can't predict. Uh, I can agree with you on just about everything that you have stated during uh, that particular segment right there. But uh, I like to look at numbers and Numbers can be read in, in many different ways, but I think we can all agree here that when we look at a school shooting, less than 1% of 1% of schools have had a, a shooting event. I don't, I don't think anybody can argue that number. Uh, and hopefully there are never any more. But you brought up something last evening. I'm not sure if it was in front of Dr. DeFalco or this other gentleman, O'Leary, uh, and the uh, middle school teachers about school safety when it comes to, you know, fights in the hallway, sexual assault, et cetera. Uh, the principals of the middle schools seem to be thinking that everything is hunky-dory. And after listening to your comments, I said to myself, you know what? I have heard about this. I have heard about that. Uh, I think there are more of those side events that nobody really wants to talk about, if you know what I mean, than certainly a major event like a parkland. Well, it was not myself who brought up the particular or specific incident that was being referred to. That was Mr. Oliveira. Um, yeah, that was me. I don't, I don't have the facts on um, specific incidents that are occurring in the in the in the schools as far as certain incidents of um bullying fighting uh what was referred to as sexual assault i don't i don't have that information um so that information i'm not going to take for full i don't know um in its full context, because again, what's the definition and who's providing that information? Um, as far as the, the the minor, what I referred to as a five percent that of the student body that may be causing the the havoc and disruptions in the classrooms. Um, yeah, that 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 I think is a, a good safe number to say that these are the ones that are causing a disruption in the school. Um, but to what extent? I don't know. I'm not asking for specific information other than hearing from students, um, teachers, staff members, that there is a problem in, in two of the three middle schools that I can say that I'm hearing from. Well, in that case, it, it still begs the question, um, the plans that have been put into place that these principals were saying seems to be working. Obviously, there are two new principals uh, this year, so they can't go off of last year's figures. But, look, I'm still hearing the complaints, even though I don't do the Ed Focus anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, I, and as I am as well. And that's why I'm saying as far as the, the two of the three middle school principals, they, they, they're, they're correct. They have nothing to compare because they weren't there last year. Um, so, I mean, as far as getting those schools under control, that's what I emphasized last night at the meeting. Those two principals have to focus on getting the disruptive students and, and the problem of the, of the disruption in the classrooms under control. That's where the school climate is going to fix itself. 
once you get the students under control on that small percentage, the rest will follow. Yeah, I, I need some help. What is uh, the success center? Or uh, I heard that a couple of times. Uh, I, I got to tell you, that sounds like a play on words. Well, I, and I have to agree with you. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, from what I'm, from what I've been told, the Student Success Center is, um, you know, as it's been labeled, if a student comes into school on a particular day, um, you know, and they need their quote timeout period, they can go to the Success Center, get themselves acclimated. Um, Socially, emotionally. Time out. That's what we do to two- I, and three-year-olds. I know. That's what I'm saying. I'm not agreeing with it. But this is what I'm being told that the student success centers are for. Um, so I'm not a big fan of giving that. I mean, when I go to work, I don't have time to say, well, I really had a bad day today. I, I need about an hour um, you know, to, to get myself under control and, and make sure that I'm ready to give – 80 percent of of myself um you know that's where we're we're coddling in in my opinion in my statement we're coddling a little too much and they have to be taught that there is a right and a wrong and there are consequences for your wrong and that there are consequences for or positive consequences for doing the right thing but we don't have to but we shouldn't be rewarding for positive behavior. I was against it from the beginning, and I'll still say the same thing now. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. Well, it seems to be working. That's what I heard from one of the principals last night. Well, again, I mean, you may say it's working. Um, what, what, what is there to compare to? Because, again, we, we really don't see any – specifics other than okay so the the conduct card or awful re- office referrals whatever term they want to use have gone down yeah i i i hear that i i and i have to say i i'm i'm mocking uh what i heard because basically hundreds of students are earning rewards for achievement and behavior you know I, i'm i'm sorry uh i i can't buy that Achievement, we should be rewarding kids for their achievement in academics. Thank you. But rewarding students for behavior? No, that's that's not that's not life. That's not that that's not the way I went to school. Um, and that's not the way you went to school. There were consequences for, for bad behavior and bad performance. But the state, the city, the district, the federal government, whoever we want to blame We've softened education to the point where we have to find the the happy medium so we can make sure that, you know, we've covered every possible angle of the students' misbehavior. I got you. And let's let's get to the let's get to the crux of the why. Five zero eight nine nine six zero five hundred. I've had people waiting. I think I'd like to get to them. John Oliveira, Chris Cotter in studio. Hello. Hello. Hello, are you talking to me, bro? I am. Okay, good to hear from you. Um, and uh, good afternoon, gentlemen from the school committee. No. Uh, good afternoon. I don't know if you've heard my story before, but um, I was a custodian at the Ford Middle School. And um, they have one resource officer for the both buildings, and they do a very fine job. Uh, in fact, you may, you are, uh, Chris Carter, you may know the officer that was there previously, you might know the officer there now. Um, and like I said, they do a very good job there, and that was the safest building I ever felt, you know, as far as being in the school. And uh, the only problem is, see, I retired, it'll be a year in May, due to security issues brought on by the after-school uh, basketball, the AYAA people. Uh, the adults were worse than the kids. Uh, the adults like to keep the door open between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. When there was no officer around, they would leave the door wide open. And we could have had a situation like what happened in Florida. 
at the time I was there. And when I reprimanded the coaches on it, I was suspended for two days without pay due to our illustrious uh, business manager at Cushnet Middle School. And then I was forced into retirement. Wow. Uh, either of you two want to respond to that? Thanks for the call. Okay. I th- well, I think a big thing, uh, you know, and, and this gentleman brought it up, and, and I know the administration is working on it, uh, is, you know, procedural issues and, and ensuring that procedures are followed. Uh, but that goes back to educating the children as well uh, and, and the parents of the children. Um, and it's, it's a culture change the way I perceive it. It's a, it's a culture change you have to have in your mind about security issues. Chris, quickly. Um, I, I, again, I mean, it's security issues. And, and again, it's, a, it's an after school issue that this gentleman referred to. Um, so, I mean, that in itself should have been something contractually as far as the rental of the school. I mean, that, that should have been something that the business manager in that particular district should have addressed. Gotcha. And I can't really answer based on what information he provided. We continue on the Barry Richard Show. Hello, you're on with John and Chris. Hello, can you hear me all right? Excellent. Well, huh. I got to say, Brian, um, John Oliveira, that's a great idea um, because training is is a great thing hope they never have to use it and in the florida scenario uh the guys the kids that went to rotc uh were the ones that helped save a lot of the kids and i think from just from listening here your second guess i lost just lost all due respect and with when that's all due respect because i can smell politics here to beat the band and John Oliveira, you're all alone, and you better be real careful. And the other guy that's on there, I used to have respect, but I don't believe it. I think you're in bed with the mayor and the rest of them, and um, you're being extremely political right now because that is an officer of the law and someone with common sense would absolutely know that training on one of these shooter situations, and, you're, and I'll tell you right now, let's listen to your language, and it was all over the board. I mean, uh, I wouldn't want to be interrogating you for uh, some kind of crime because you wouldn't look good. And that's just my opinion, and I'm disgusted, and I'm going to hang up right now. All right. Uh, uh, John, thank you. You're all alone. Be careful because these other guys are out to get you. Uh, Chris Cotter, you, you got to respond, I guess. Well, sure. I can respond to that, that, you know, he's entitled to his opinion. Um my first question would be, how many school committee meetings has this gentleman been to to see where the mayor and I are in bed together? Um, that's certainly not the case. Better uh, nails, maybe. <laughs> I think I think Mr. Oliveira has, has, has good points, um, where this gentleman obviously feels that, you know, you can't have um, ideas putting them together and coming up to a mutual resolution. And as I said last night, I'm just because I'm not in favor of it um, doesn't mean that I wouldn't come to a mutual understanding of trying to figure out what best practice we're going to come up with. Um, you know, so I mean, he's entitled to his opinion. Obviously, he doesn't know me from a hole in the wall as far as my own personal um, issues when it comes to, quote, his term of politics. So... You know, it is what it is. I'm not going to change his mind, and if I lost his respect, then sorry. Uh, I've got to wonder here, and since we know that the type of incident that's a a, a Columbine or um, Parkland rarely, if ever, happens, but has certainly occurred less than 1% or 1% of the schools, why is it necessary to come up with the game plan and to, and if it was so important, why did it have to wait until Parkland to be instituted? Certainly, we we've had other events, uh, uh, Connecticut, 
several other schools. Why now does it seem to be creeping into the psyche of uh, city councilors, I suppose mayors, governors? Uh, why now? Well, I think you've had, after every one of those events, you've had some level of major interest, knee-jerk legislation uh, that, that went on, and, and we're seeing that again. And I guarantee you, six months from now, there'll be another focus. And, and that's why it's important that those of us on the school committee, we need to stay on focus on this, because, and the administration uh, has to stay focused on this, because this is an ongoing ongoing issue. Security is an on, ongoing uh, pr problem. Uh, it's, it's always in flux. You always have to adapt and adjust for it. Uh, but I do want to say thank you to Chris, though, for mentioning, uh, you know, we do need more people, more parents, more citizens getting to these school committee meetings and these subcommittee meetings. We want to hear what's going on, and we want, I want to certainly hear what you have to say. Uh, and, and, you know, you need to get in contact with us. You, you need to come to these meetings. 508-996-0500. Final call for John Oliveira and Chris Carter. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It appears that today's schools, they, what they want to do is turn them into prisons. Metal detectors, surveillance cameras, pat down, uh, going through, uh, rummaging through their backpacks. Uh, do you have a fear that um, schools are going to become uh, more like prisons than uh, places of education? And that's my question for you. Uh, not, certainly not on my watch. That's not going to happen. Um, you know, but we do have to secure our schools. I mean, the schools need to be a safe Against place. what? So we can we can educate our children. No, 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 no. Why you're securing against what? Any particular threat from the outside? We don't need open doors, you know. And and that when, when you were a kid, did in, you, were there open doors? It was a different time back then, Brian. You I, know, I, I I know it was a different time, but in in my psyche, I, I think we see a lot of this promoted more because you have 24-hour news channels and and people are are interested. They're horrific events and. You know, like the Hindenburg going mm -hmm. down back in that day. Oh, we got to do something. And next thing you know, helium can't be used, et cetera, et cetera. Chris Cotter. And I have to agree. Uh, uh, no, I, I don't want to see our schools become prisons. Um, you know, I think, and, and to answer your question, Brian, yes. When I was in elementary school back in the 70s, yes, our schools were locked. We, we, we had entrance. At certain entrance at certain doors and after a certain time the doors were locked where you couldn't you could get out but you couldn't get in other than the main entrance so the security of making sure that it's not a public access to every entrance in our schools yeah that's been around for a long time um, so again I think we need to make sure that we're, we're getting the buy-in of the students um, because, again, as I mentioned yesterday, the students, if they see a student banging on a door, they're going to open the door for the student. Um, because, again, it's one it's one thing that we teach kids, hey, if, if somebody wants to get in and it's, and it's somebody of your own age or you, you want to be polite and open the door. But that's where the mentality is changing. We, we need to make sure that everybody understands that Everybody has to use one entrance to get into the school after certain hours. Um, because, again, early morning, the doors are open for entrance for the student body. So I don't want to see... Yeah, we're back to doors. one door. Uh, I, I Look, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I'm not sure that I'm in total agreement, and maybe I'm just stuck in the... 70s when we had free access to go in and come out and you know i only remember this one kid i, I probably shouldn't say his name now uh but he went running down the hallway with a gun and cracked what one of the glasses on the door but he, he he was off to bill ricca and never to be seen again at least i, I don't know maybe he's out now but uh, well, my, my point is this brian and i'll use the high school and the middle schools as an example they don't enter from one door because of the vast numbers, we can't have 1,200 students mm. at Normandon and 2,400 students at the high school all walking through one entrance. 
that that just can't happen. It can't happen. I mean, it, it's just. And so, are there uh, teachers or staff at all of these doors watching who walks in, greeting them, "Hi, how you doing today?" And uh, s- supposed to know each one is definitely a student. And how is that supposed to happen, other than having an ID around your neck? I don't know. I'm I'm asking I'm the, the question. And, and, and I'm I'm going to throw it right back. I mean, sure, we can have teachers there, 2,400 students. Do you are you going to remember the names of 2,400 kids and recognize them from one end of the school to the next? I highly doubt it. Probably I I not. But it. I suppose I would remember many of the same students that would be coming through a particular door. I I, I you're, you're right. It's an impossible task, but if if safety is necessary, I mean, and what are we talking about in this particular case? Uh, a, a high level event. To me, the big problem are the the small fights that happen. Uh, somebody might have brought a knife into school, you know, but not necessarily to use it on a student or maybe a particular student that he or she is going after. Those kind of events happen much more often than the Parkland, Florida type events. And so when we say what are you, I, I was saying to, to uh, your colleague, John Oliveira, what kind of event? Because you would do something different for a Parkland type event than to stop gang violence, let's say. You're absolutely right. And, and, and the SROs at the high school are in fact aware of who the, the problem um, outside players are. And, and that mm-hmm. that's a huge advantage because they know what to watch for and, and, and they're getting the information from several different areas of issues that have been occurring outside of school, inside of school, um, familiar, family issues um, amongst different areas or whatever the case is. All right. I mean, I, I will say that. You're right. We haven't had an incident at any of our schools, knock on wood. I pray to God that it never does happen. But Mr. Oliver also was correct. Our society is, and, and our political realm is reactional. They're not proactive. Parkland happened. Now all of a sudden it's in the limelight. True. Mr. Uh, Oliver is 100% correct. A, a tree went at a, a tree, a, a chair went at a teacher one day and I haven't heard any definitive remedy for, for something like that. Chris Cotter, I want to thank you so much for being with us. I hope you get your power back ASAP. John Oliveira, thanks for coming in studio today. Hour two of the Barry Richard show when we come back.